Okay, this is a video for 5.1. And in this video, we're going to be talking about exponential functions and their graphs. Okay, so it really is a lot of introductory concepts. So for the first page, what we have here is um, just to point out that so far, all we've ever dealt with were algebraic functions, which included polynomial functions and rational functions. Now remember, linears and quadratics are just specific types of polynomial functions, okay? Linears are polynomial functions of degree one, quadratics are polynomial functions of degree two. And we know that rational functions are the ratio of two polynomials, okay? So in this chapter, we're gonna study two types of non-algebraic functions, okay? And those are called exponential functions and in 5.2, eventually we'll introduce logarithmic functions, okay? These functions are called transcendental functions. There are lots of different kinds of transcendental functions. Um, trigonometric functions are also included, um, but transcendental is just another title for these type of uh, functions, okay? Now, the definition of an exponential function is Basically, you have a numerical base and your variable is in the exponent. You've been used to seeing things like this, where your variable was the base and the number was the exponent. Now you're gonna see things the opposite. So the base will be three and the variable will be the exponent, okay? Um, now, important thing to keep in mind that your base must be a positive number and it cannot be one. Why can it not be one? Because one with any exponent is just one, okay? And if you have f of x equal to one, that's just a horizontal line. That's not um, at one. That's not technically a, um, it's not an exponential function. Exponential functions are curves, okay? So this is why x a cannot be one, the base cannot be one. Um, okay, so then, uh, oh, and this is just saying the exact same thing that I said. So if it were one, then it would look like this, but one raised to any exponent is still one, okay? Um, and it says, you have evaluated a to x for integer and rational values of x before. For example, you know that four cubed is 64, you can type in the calculator four raised to the one half and get two. Um, however, to evaluate 4x for any real number, you need to interpret forms with irrational exponents. So it may be that when you're done, you're going to get um, different values, okay? So let's say I wanted to plug in uh, the square root of 2 as my exponent. We know that square root of 2 equals this decimal. But if I round it, uh, each time I round it more accurately, I get more accurate approximations, okay? So it's best to not round, just use your calculator. But if you have to, you want to use as many decimals as possible um, to keep your calculations as close to the actual answer as possible. Um, now, for what am I doing? Trying to find something. Oh, there it is. Okay. So for here, they want us to use the calculator to evaluate all of these functions. And I definitely need to use the one that I suggested y'all are using. So let me grab this black calculator. I have a yellow one, but it's not exactly the same as yours. So I want you, you definitely have to know how to use your calculator. Okay. So if I want to do um, two and I want to plug in negative or 3.1, what you need to type in your calculator needs to look like this, two to the negative 3.1, okay? And so to do that, I'm gonna hit two and then I'm gonna hit this button here that gives me an exponent. So it gives me the exponent. I don't think I pressed it. There it goes. 
It makes it look like an exponent. And then I can just type in negative 3.1. And then I get that response. Um, it doesn't tell me how far to round it. So I'm just going to include as many decimal places as my calculator gives me. OK. Then here, I'm going to plug in um, 2 to the negative, And the x value is going to become pi. So I'm saying 2 exponent negative pi. And I hit enter. And the answer is 0 0.111331473. And then finally, the last one is 0 0.6. And the exponent I'm plugging in is 3 halves. So I would put 0 0.6 exponent. And then I would do 3 fraction 2 and hit enter. And I get 0 0.46475802. OK. And so essentially, you're just going to have to use your calculator a lot here in this section when evaluating these uh, exponential expressions. OK. Now, in order for me to graph a function, Essentially, all you're doing is just plugging in a bunch of x values, plotting those points, and then seeing what the image looks like. OK, so it looks like they chose to plug in. I don't know why they did negative 3. I wouldn't have done that. That's just me. I usually like to go negative 2 to positive 2. Um, and so when I plug in negative 2 into here in your calculator, it tells you 1 fourth. When you plug negative 1 in there, your calculator tells you 1 half. If I do two to the power zero, I get one. Two to the power two, I get, or I'm sorry, two to the power one, I get two. And then two to the power two, I get four. Same thing with this function here. So if I'm plugging in negative two, that's four to the negative two power, which is one over 16. Four to the negative one power is one fourth. Four to the zero power is one. Four to the one power is four. And then four to the second power is 16. And so all they did was plot all of those points for the first function, which happens to be this one. And then they plotted all these points for the other function, which happens to be this one. OK. And so then you can see, I'll leave this there. Let me focus in case anyone wants to zoom in and see that a little bit better. I'm trying to find the perfect focus. OK, there we go. So that might help a little tiny bit. OK, so you do have both of those graphs. Now, notice that the graphs are curves. OK, so here's some basic information about general exponential graphs. OK, they all have this curve here. OK, and as long as there's nothing else extra, like there's no coefficients here, there's nothing being added, subtracted up there, and nothing being added or subtracted on the side, it does fit these general summaries. OK, one, we know that our uh, base has to be a positive number. Two, if you notice the domain, it does go all the way to the left and all the way to the right forever. So the domain is negative infinity to infinity. The range, however, it never goes below the x-axis, and it actually never even touches the x-axis, OK? It has an asymptote. Um, and this line, the y-axis, is that asymptote, OK? So there is a horizontal asymptote at um, y equals 0. It says the x-axis, or y equals 0, is the horizontal asymptote. So if it's never going to touch this horizontal asymptote, then that basically means my range is going to be from 0 up toward infinity forever. But it's not going to include 0 because I will never touch the, intercept, the um, asymptote. So that's why we have 0 with the parentheses and then infinity, positive infinity. The y-intercept, no matter what, when I plug in 0, doesn't matter what this base is. When you plug in 0 for the exponent, you always get 1. OK, and then, of course, the function is continuous. What I would highly suggest is that when you're graphing these, that you do two points 
or three points actually. You always want to plug in negative one, zero, and one for your a, and that will help you. For negative one, you're going to get a to the negative one power, which is actually just the reciprocal of a. When you plug in zero, anything to the power zero is one. And when you plug in one, anything to the power one is that same thing. So you should have these three points on any exponential, basic exponential function. Now, if you had a negative exponent, it has the same domain, the same range, the same intercept, but notice that the curve is going downward now, okay? The, the horizontal asymptote is still the same. Everything is the same, but instead of going in this direction, it's going in the other direction, okay? And a negative exponent is essentially just the reciprocal. So that is the same as saying y over a to the x, okay? And so consequently, guess um, what these points are gonna be. If I'm plugging in negative one, um, a negative and a negative is gonna be a positive, so I get A. When I plug in zero, A to the zero is still one. And when I plug in positive one, I'm gonna get A to the negative one, which is one over A, okay? So be very, very careful there. Now, Let's see, we do have this one-to-one -one property. It says, as a result, the graphs pass the horizontal line test. Therefore, the functions are one-to-one -one functions. So since they're one-to-one -one functions, you can use what is called the one-to-one -one property, okay? This basically tells us that if we had an equation that looked like this, the only way that this expression can be exactly the same as that expression is if the exponents are the same. Why? Because the bases are already obviously the same. So in order for this value to be the exact value of this one, that means that our exponent of the first one would have to equal the exponent of the second one, okay? That is the one-to-one -one property. Now, here's a new introductory thing, um, base E. In the past, you knew about pi. Right, it's 3.14159 blah, 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 right? It's just this decimal that goes on and on forever. Um, so there's another number like this number that pops up a lot in nature, okay? And that's why it's called the natural number. Um, and this number is called E. They use E to symbolize this number, okay? E is the basic exponential base, okay? Um, that's why it's called the natural base, and that's why they use E because it's exponential, okay? Um, but the number itself is kind of like this one. This one is always 3.14159265, blah, 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 right? E is also always this number, and this pattern does not continue after that, okay? So if I go into my calculator and I type in E, um, it does have, it does break its pattern after, um, let me see, E to the one, and then I'm gonna do times like, nope, it doesn't ever show me in my calculator. My calculator can only show me so many digits and this is how many digits it shows me. But after this, I do know that you might see, oh, it says 182, eight, um, 1828, and you're thinking it might be 1828 again, but it's not, okay? So it's not a repeating decimal, it's not. It looks like it is at the beginning, but then after that it doesn't, okay? So you have to be very, very, very careful. Um, it is not a repeating decimal. If it were, I would be able to put E in terms of a fraction, okay? But you can't. There's a fraction pretty darn close to it, and I think it's 22 over eight. or 22 over seven, I think is what it is. No, 22 over seven is like pi. Anyway, forget about this then. I'm thinking of pi. Um, so it is an ongoing decimal that does not repeat. Looks like it does, but it doesn't, okay? 
And so you might see a function that looks like this, e to the x. Now, it might look like there's two variables there, but there's not because e is a number, specifically the number 2.718, okay? So you have to remember that even though you see e, it is a number, and that is an exponential um, base, an exponential function. So here they want us to use our calculator to evaluate um, e to the x at each one of these x values. So for the first one, that's e to the negative 2, e to the negative 1, e to the 0 0.25, and then e to the negative 0 0.3. So in your calculator, you have a button right here that has e box. If I push it once, it pops up e. If I push it again, it changes it to the 10. So make sure that you only push this button once so that you have the base e. Then you're going to put in the exponents, OK? So I'm going to type in negative 2. And I get 0 0.13533325283. Then now I'm going to do e to the negative 1 exponent. And I get 0 0.36787944143. Okay, now I'm going to do e to the 0 0.25. I get 1.28402417. And then finally, e to the negative 0 0.3. I get 0 0.74081822. Okay, now what if I just wanted to type e in the calculator? You have to remember that that's the same thing as saying e to the invisible one exponent. So you would do E, and then you would type in 1 as your exponent. And that's what gives you the 2.71828, blah, 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 OK? All of these decimals keep going. My calculator just only goes so far, OK? In the computer, it will ask it around so that it can count your answer correct or not correct. OK. now. We do have some applications of exponentials, and one of those uh, applications has to do with interest and compounding interest. So if you have T in years, um, your balance is A, your principal is P. So A is like the amount after some time in the account, and then P, principal, that's what you put in, okay, into the account or if you borrowed it, that's what you borrowed, okay? But that's what principal stands for. And then you have an annual interest rate of R, and it must be in decimal form when you're plugging these numbers in, okay? And so if you're comp compounding your interest, that means collecting the interest, okay? Like calculating how much interest is on there and then adding it to your balance, okay? That process is called compounding. And if it's compounded a certain number of times per year, then you use this formula. And notice that n appears twice in that formula. However, if it has continuous compounding, meaning it's constantly calculating your interest and adding it back on, then it's going to be this formula, okay? And there is no n here because it's continuously happening. And notice that it now has that e in there. So remember, if you're talking about annual compounding, then that means n equals one because it's only once per year. If you're compounding semi-annually, that means that n is two. If you're compounding quarterly, which most businesses do, that would be four. If you're compounding monthly, that's how your month, that's how your credit cards compound. That would be n equal 12. Um, and then there's daily. And depending on the book, I really have to go figure out which one your book uses. But some books use, um, some books use 360 and some books use 364, and some books use 365. So normally I try to stay away from daily, 
only because depending on what book you have, they'll use a different number depending on the author, okay? Some people are like, eh, 360 days is accurate enough. Um, some people are like, well, no, there's only 364 days in one year guaranteed, except on leap year, you have 365 days. Um, so it just depends on the book really the author, who you're talking about and what they're preferring to use. So we typically stay away from daily. Chances are you're most likely gonna see one of these options, okay? Um, or if it specifically tells you, hey, it's gonna compound eight times per year, then you know exactly what the N is because they tell you it explicitly, okay? It's implicit if they use one of these words. If they say, oh, and this interest is compounded quarterly, well, then you have to know that quarterly means N is four. Whereas if it tells you, and this count um, a compounds interest um, five times a year, then you know that N is five, okay? Then they can get real tricky on you and say it compounds five times a month. And then you have to remember five times a month means five times 12, which means 60 times a year, okay? So pay attention to how they tell you how many times it's compounded. But if they say the word compounds continuously, this word here, then you know you have to use a totally different formula that does not have N in it whatsoever, okay? So here's a first example. It says you invest $1,200 in an annual rate of 3%. So if this is my investment, then that means what I'm putting in. So that's my P. So P is going to equal 12 um, thousand. And then it says my annual rate is 3%. So R equals, but I have to put this in a decimal. So it's actually 0 0.03 is my rate. And then it says find the balance, which means find A. And then it says after five years. So five years means T equals five. And then what does it say? It has three different ones. So I have to do one for compounding quarterly, which means N equals four, compounding monthly, which means N equals 12, or continuously, which is a totally different formula, okay? So for part A, and I think the answers are over here. I don't think I need to write everything out. Yes. So for part A, they have n equal to four, the five years, the 3%. And then of course they know that uh, your investment P was equal to 12,000, okay? And we had said that R was equal to 0 0.03 and we said T was equal to five. So this is the formula they're using, okay? And in that formula, they're gonna plug in the 12,000 for P one is the number one, so that doesn't change. R is the decimal 0 0.03 or 0 0.03, same thing, whether it looks like this or it looks like this with the extra zero in front of the decimal, those are both the same, okay? Over N, which happens to be four, and then N again times T, which was five. And if you type this whole thing in your calculator, it will tell you that, okay? And it does have to be all of that exactly the way it looks. So I'm going to type 12,000 parentheses, one plus fraction, 0 0.03 over four, get to the side, close it, get an exponent, four times five. It literally needs to look exactly like it does on the paper. And when I hit enter, it tells me this exact number. But since I am talking about money, you just round to the second decimal place. So that nine makes that zero go up to 21, okay? And we end up with this as our final answer for part A, okay? Part B is gonna be exactly the same, but because it's monthly, the N is going to be different. But the time, the rate, and the principal amounts are gonna stay the same. So again, P is gonna equal 12,000, um, T is equal to 5, R is equal to 0 0.03, and N is equal to 12 because it's monthly this time, okay? So we plug everybody in. 12,000 for P, 1 is 1, 
0 0.03 for R, 12 for N, 12 for N again, and then five for T. And so I already got all that in there. I'm just gonna change the, the ends. So N was 12. And now it looks exactly like it does on the paper and I ended up with this number. So see the one is not enough to change the zero. So it stays 13,939.40. But you can't do the problem unless you can identify what each variable is, what number to plug in, and you plug it into your calculator correctly, okay? Um, for part C, that one said continuous compounding, which means I used a whole other formula, okay? Now I do still know that P is 12,000. I know that R is equal to 0 0.03, and I know that T is equal to five, but I don't have an N because it says continuous. And there is no N in this formula to plug in. So we plugged in the P, we plugged in the R, we plugged in the T, and then if I type all of that in my calculator, one, two, three, I get E to the 0 0.03 times five. And I get the exact same number they do. This zero is not enough for the one to go up. So it does stay one cent. Okay, now for our practice problems, it says sketch the graph of this. So again, I like to make my table and I use these three values. I always use those three values. So let's see, three raised to the negative one exponent, we get one third. Three raised to the zero exponent, I get one. Three raised to the one exponent, I get three. And so if I draw that, Um, negative one and one third is about here, zero and one, and then one and three. And so you can see it's going in this direction. Okay, and that's pretty much the sketch of that graph. Now, if I wanna do the bottom one, let's plug it in. Two raised to the negative, and I'm gonna plug in negative one. I get two. 2 raised to the negative, and I'm going to plug in 0. I get 1. 2 raised to the negative, and I'm going to plug in 1. I get 1 half. And if I draw these, I'm going to get negative 1 and 2, 0 and 1, 1 and 1 half. And so then this one looks the other direction. And now I have the sketch of that one, okay? So it's just a matter of plugging in those three X values and finding the corresponding Y values and then plotting them on a graph and connecting the dots, okay? Now here, this one says, use the one-to-one -one property to solve the equation. Well, remember, this is the one-to-one -one property. Okay, so it says if the bases are the same, then the exponents must be the same. Okay, because you're telling me these things are equal. So if this side equals this side, and you already know the bases are the same, that means the exponents must be the same. Problem is, is I do have a base already over here. The issue is, is I need the same base over on the other side. I just need to figure out what the exponent would be. And it's not a zero, that's just a circle. Okay, so what should this exponent be here? Okay, I don't know. I know three cubed is 27, but if I want the 27 downstairs, I think I need to make the exponent negative. So let's check and make sure that that's actually true. So three raised to the negative three exponent is one over 27. So this one over 27 is actually equal to three raised to the negative three. Now I can use the one-to-one -one property that says that this side can only equal that side 
if the left exponent is exactly the same value as the right exponent. Now, what x value would make that true? Let's solve for x. And I get negative 1. So if x were negative 1, this would be negative 1 minus 2, which is negative 3. And we already know 3 to the negative 3 would equal 127. Okay. And so your answer here is going to be negative 1. Now, here's another problem. It's our last practice problem. It says a philanthropist deposits, so this is your P, um, in a trust fund that pays 5%, 5.5%. 5 .5%. So that means R equals 0 0.055. Here's the key word here though, compounded continuously. That means this formula. So I have P, I have R, the only thing I'm missing is T. It says the balance will be given to the college from which the philanthropist graduated after the money has earned interest for 40 years. So that's my T. How much will the college receive? So I'm going to plug in um, my 2000 for my deposit or this person's deposit, 0 0.055 for R and 40 for T what we get here. Oh, wrong calculator. So I get 2000 E to the 0 0.055 times 40. And we get A equals 18050.027. And so this is money. So that seven is going to make this go up to a three. It says round answer to the nearest cent. And I just did that. So this is how much money that the school is going to receive. 18,050 bucks and three cents. Okay. Now, that is actually the end of 5.1. So I will see you in the next video on 5.2.